The New York Mets officially introduced J.D. Martinez on Saturday and made another round of roster cuts. We'll discuss that and a special announcement for the show, today's edition, Locked on Mets. You are Locked on Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello to all you amazing Mets fans, you're watching Locked On Mets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Errol Ryan Finkelstein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on X at Finkelstein Ryan. You can also find some of my writing at JustBaseball.com, where I work as the managing editor. Well, a lot of news on Saturday when it comes to the Mets roster, and it was the first official day of J.D. Martinez being a New York Met. He was in camp, he was introduced to the media, and we also saw some videos and pictures early in the day of him taking hats, but more importantly, of him having his arm wrapped around Mark Viento, showing the leadership he's going to bring this club. Apparently, from what Martinez told the media, him and Vientos actually go back a little bit. Both of them, South Florida kids, J.D. Martinez worked out, actually, where to say South Florida kids when J.D. Martinez is nearly 40, but they both grew up in South Florida. J.D. Martinez still lives in South Florida works out down there, and you know, works out at his alma mater, Nova Southeastern University. Shout out to my wife who get, who's getting her master's from the same university. Uh, but J.D. has met Vientos before, has worked out with him before. So now kind of a bittersweet reunion for Mark here as the guy who I'm sure in the past he's looked up to as a mentor, uh, comes in to take his job essentially. And it's uh, a situation that Martinez spoke to the media about how um, you know, he had a similar journey, you know, to the big leagues as far as it taking some time for him to really break through and how talent's going to always rise to the surface. And Mark Vientos just has to focus on himself and the opportunities will come. So uh, it was interesting to hear that. Also, J.D. talked about why he chose the Mets, uh, why he did not choose the Giants. That was because he didn't like their ballpark. He said, if I go there and I hit 260 with 20 home runs, I might be out of the game. And he clearly wants to continue his big league career. And having an offseason like this one, probably pretty scary for a guy that has had a prolific career. But the phone wasn't ringing much. And he talked about that as well. But um, you know, just kind of how the landscape uh, for free agents isn't great right now. Kind of foreshadowed another labor strike coming, which I know we all hate to hear. But um, coming down to his decision with being a Met, he spoke to Pete Alonzo a little bit in the process. Alonzo recruiting him trying to get him on, on board, trying to let the Mets brass know that he wanted him. And they got the deal done. And he talked about being addicted to the playoffs. And this was the team he chose to try to get back there. And if you think about the other teams that were offering him, if it was the Angels, it does make sense why he chose to come to the Mets. And I do think he's going to have a really big impact, uh, not only on this lineup, but on the team in general. The, the fact that he said he's an open book to talk hitting, and the amount of young hitters on this team that can learn from him, even someone like a Pete Alonso or a Brandon Nimmo or Francisco Lindor can learn from a vet like JD Martinez. So I think this was a really great addition. If he can stay healthy, not only is he going to help the team throughout the year, uh, you know, just with his big bat in the middle of the lineup, but he's going to really have that trickle down effect when it comes to teaching hitting similar to what Max Scherzer had uh, for the last couple of years. And Pete Alonso kind of referenced that as well. To make room for J.D. Martinez, the Mets had to DFA somebody, and Phil Bickford was the guy they chose. If you're listening to this show for a while, shouldn't be too surprised. I have been sort of expecting Bickford to be one of the guys that would be out in this reliever mix. So he is DFA'd. We'll see if anybody claims him, what happens if he ends up back in the Mets system. But for now, he is on his way out, and that cleared the room for J.D. Martinez. The Mets also announced that Shintaro Fujinami has been optioned again, something we've discussed on this show plenty. Has a lot of control issues. He had the ability to be sent to the minor leagues, which gives the Mets more roster flexibility to keep some of the options that don't have any options. So Fuji goes down. They also reassigned Austin Adams. Again, no surprise. He was a non roster invite. He was the last non roster invite standing when it came to the pitchers. He really showed himself well in camp. I imagine we will see him at some point. It's just not going to be at the start of the season. So that leaves the reliever mix down to Sean Reed Foley, 
Johan Ramirez and Michael Tonkin. We've talked about those three being the finalist, and here we are. As I've said in the past, I believe that Michael Tonkin signed a split contract, which would allow the Mets to option him without losing him, and that's why I have predicted that Tonkin will be the final name cut here, and it'll be Johan Ramirez and Sean Reed Foley that make the team. But again, there's been others who cover the Mets, like Anthony DeComo and Joe DeMeo, that I've seen paint Tonkin as a guy with no options. So if that's the case, I'm sure he will make the team. But again, did sign a split contract, so I think uh, he'll be the last guy that is cut here. Now, when it comes to the position player front, Tomas Nito, Luke Voigt, and Jose Iglesias were all made aware that they will not make the team. Uh, that leaves G-Man Choi, DJ Stewart, and Zach Short for those last three guys vying for one bench spot. And it's assuming that Mark Fiantos makes the team, but J.D. Martinez will not be with the team to start the season. He has been assigned to the minor leagues, which is an official transaction that will take place once the season starts. He then has to spend 10 days in the minor leagues. That's just to ramp himself up, get his body ready so he doesn't get hurt, as he said. He has to be in good shape to go out there and play. He's starting from square one. So it might be longer than those 10 days. We really don't know from now till he's eligible to join the team. It's a 15-day window, so he's got two weeks. If he's ready by then. He'll join the Mets, and that's when we could see Mark Vientos sent down. But I would hope that in that first 10-day window, they give Vientos every day playing time at DH. And because of that, I don't really see the value in having G-Man Choi on the roster or having DJ Stewart on the roster. Instead, to me, what makes the most sense is having Zach Short, who is on the 40 with no options. The other two guys, you know, Choi on a minor league contract, although he could sign elsewhere. DJ Stewart has an option. I would hang on to short while you can. If Mark Vientos has a great start to the season and you want to keep him up with the big league club and just find some playing time for him, whether it's at third base, giving J.D. Martinez a day at DH, Pete Alonso at first, however you want to try to you know, mangle some playing time together for him, then that would be when you can DFA short. But I think short's going to make the team. And like I said, I think Sean Reed Foley and Johan Ramirez will make the team. So that pretty much recaps where the Mets are at with their roster. Uh, there's only a couple days left in camp before that to make these decisions. And then Thursday, start of the season. So exciting stuff, but I have uh, a big announcement kind of in the next segment. I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey uh, as far as uh, this show. So I'm really excited to talk about that more. Before we get to it, though, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Say goodbye to Busted Brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tournament. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's $200 to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. All you got to do is visit FanDuel.com slash locked on, and you can bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. Also, this is the time to bet on your MLB futures. You want to bet on the Mets to win the World Series, to hit their over on their win total. See Pete Alonzo hit his over on home runs at 41 and a half. You can find all of that on FanDuel. But before you place those futures bets, again, place that $5 bet on a tournament game or the NBA game right now. If you win it, $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. So today is March 24th, 2024. And that's a very important date for me because it marks five years of doing this show. My first podcast on Locked on Mets was March 24th, 2019. And since then, I have done 1,344 episodes of this show in 1,827 days. I did the math on that. That is over 70% of my life that has been devoted to this show doing podcasts. That has been more than five episodes a week because I've done bonus shows and everything else that I've taken it to more than five a day. But since then, five years ago, March 24th, I have committed myself to Monday through Friday trying to put up a show for all of you. And really, it's for me, and it's for my dad, my number one listener. Um, but I want to take the time today to recap the journey. Uh, for those of you who've been along the ride for four-plus years, because I know in the beginning it was probably just my dad listening, um, to those of you who've even come on lately, who maybe are curious about how this show came about. So before we get to the first episode, I got to take you back even further to 2006, because that was the first podcast I ever did. Huge shout out to my uncle Joe. 
uh, I was spending a week with you know him, my aunt Ellen, my cousins, Will and Jack, and it was during the All Star break. And David Wright was in the home run derby against Ryan Howard. My uncle is a huge Phillies fan. He thought it would be fun for us to do a radio show. And so that whole week we were doing shows talking about the Derby and the All-Star game, whatever was going on at the time. And my cousins aren't as big of sports fans as I am. So it was really me and my uncle doing it. And he would break up uh, you know, the show with his, his ad breaks. He's got a good sense of humor. And our big advertiser, of course, this is fake advertising, was uh, peeing on Gian, which was urinal cakes with Ozzy Gian's face on it. And it was hilarious. And ever since, it was a running joke between us that we'd always mentioned peeing on Gian in that show. Well, I fast forward to my brother-in-law's wedding, which I guess also means it was my sister's wedding, but my brother-in-law, Brad, is probably listening to this right now. So that's the way I like to phrase it. And I was a journalism student at the time. I was listening to a ton of podcasts that delivered pizza. I was a sports nut. And I just thought this might be something I should learn how to do. And me and my uncle were reminiscing. I said, can we do a podcast together? I'd love to kind of learn. He was you know, a, a computer teacher in school. He knew all about that stuff. And he could kind of teach me, show me the ropes. He was thrilled to do it. And we started Let's Think Sports, which we did for about two years. And once a week, me and my uncle would hop on a Zoom. And I would prepare a list of topics. We talk about everything in sports. And it was my first training grounds to do what I eventually now do, hosting podcasts. And I was bad. And no one listened, but my dad, again, running theme there. But it was a huge, huge growing experience. I always tell anyone who asked me about getting into podcasting, I say, just, just, you got to do reps. You got to do reps. And so that was it for me. And I had, you know, my friends do some stuff for me as well later on. But the bottom line was that was my one show, Let's Think Sports. So then you go fast forward along a little bit. I was a writer. That's always been my first passion. I still do write. Uh, But that was where my career was going. So I'm, in my last semester of college, I'm doing a bunch of freelance writing. I'm delivering pizzas. I'm doing my thing. And I'm listening to Locked on Heat. I'm a Miami Heat fan. I was listening to that podcast. I found out about the network. I wanted to be a listener of Locked on Mets. I looked for the show. There was no host. I went to the website. It said coming soon. And right there on the site was our CEO and founder's email, David Locke. So I sent him an email with my resume. I'd love to learn about this show. If you need a host, I'd love to host Locked on Mets. We talked on the phone. I think he liked me, but I was green and I didn't have a lot of experience. And so I didn't get the show right away. And so I sent him a demo and it was a podcast where I was previewing the Mets season. He liked my energy. He told me that I talked too fast. I did about four episodes of content in that one show, but I clearly want it and I could have the show. And there it was. I was the host of Locked on Mets. And I remember... (laughs) How surreal that was. I remember telling my family and you know, going around the pizza place. That's when I got the email and telling my friends about it. It was so cool. And then I had to do my first show and I had to do my first ad read. And it was for Blue Chew, Chewable Viagra. Um, and so I had to, here I am, whatever, 23 years old, never done anything like this, having to start an ad read saying, guys, let's talk about sex. And I was mortified, didn't know what I was doing. And that first month, it was a lot of that. And, uh, you know, I got a a check for the first 20 some odd shows that I did and it was for $37 and I was ready to quit. I I remember I come, coming to my dad and my mom and just saying, look, I I don't think I can do this. This is really hard. No one's tuning in. I got no social media following. I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, I I should just fold up shop and, and let somebody else do this show. And my dad said, listen, you made a commitment and he's always been that type of a parent, which is a good one where, Hey, you commit to be part of this team. You commit to do this club, whatever it is, you got to stick to it. He said, do it for this season. He said, I'm listening. It sounds good. You're getting there. The audience will come. Just, just keep doing it. Don't worry about what you're making. Don't worry about anything. Just do it for the love of doing it. And so that's what I did. And I was writing for Metsmerized again, because I had to say something on the show to give me credibility. So it was just, Hey, uh, you know, same intro, by the way, everyone that hates my intro, I've, I've seen the messages. I get it. I've said hello to all you amazing Mets fans since day one, March 24, 2019. I'm 1,300 plus episodes in. I'm going to keep doing it. But part of that intro was, you know, you know, I'm the host of, of like, you know, if you want to find any of my work, follow me on Twitter at Finkelstein Ryan. You can find my writing at MetsmerizedOnline.com. Got back into that community. They were the first site that ever published any of my writing. My career took me away from them. It brought me back for this show. So then I'm writing there. Um, you know, on, on the blog, 
doing my thing in 2019, finding some kind of a rhythm. And then the Marcus Stroman trade happened. And that was the first time that this show had any kind of an audience. When, when that trade happened, people tuned in, and then they stayed tuned in for my trade deadline coverage. You know, are the Mets going to sell? I remember there was this crazy time where Brody Van Wagen had said, hey, we control the starting pitching market. It runs through us because we got Stroman with two years left, Wheeler with one year left, and Noah Syndergaard with three years left. We can do anything. And then they did nothing, and they just kept Marcus Stroman. But the good thing was that second-half team was awesome. And you think about a Mets rotation that was Jacob deGrom, Zach Wheeler, Noah Syndergaard when he was good, Marcus Stroman, and Steven Matz with Pete Alonso chasing down Aaron Judge's home run record and deGrom winning a, a Cy Young. That second half of that season was awesome. And I was so happy I didn't quit the show. And there was starting to be an audience. And everything was really great at that point. My writing career was in a really good spot. I was writing about football basketball, writing so much, I was able to quit the pizza job, which was nice. Then COVID happens. The world shuts down. And it was a dark time for me because I remember I was doing a content calendar for the site I was working for at the time. But all these events we were going to go cover, South by Southwest Conference, the NBA All-Star Weekend, all these different things. And then they all started to get canceled. And within a week of Rudy Gobert testing positive for COVID, I was out of my job. And I had nothing going on. And I'm, I ended up back in my parents' house. The only thing that I had to do each day was the show. And I remember the network said we could do three times a week. I did five times a week all the way through COVID. I turned into a Mets history podcast. Uh, I did a four-part show where I did time traveling with my dad where we went through our Mets fandom. And it was a crazy time and it was weird. And I was going through it in my personal life. But the show was this like life raft that I had during that time. Then I remember October, November, 2020, the network tells us that uh, we're going to end up on YouTube and they wanted to get our faces on video more. And like, I'm sure a lot of people, I spent COVID eating and drinking a lot. <laughs> and, uh, I was not happy the way I looked. I was overweight. I was uh, back delivering pizza by the end of that point, but still kind of jobless in my career other than the, the work I was doing for Mesmerized, which wasn't paying the bills. And I just was like, man, what am I doing? And I thought about quitting then too, I'll be honest. And I didn't, I looked in the mirror and I said, what are you doing? And I changed and I dropped like 90 pounds in a year. Um, I, uh, you know, started working for just baseball in 2021, which is now I'm, I'm the manager for the site. Um, you know, I got a staff of, about 30 writers that, that are working uh, with us now that, that I'm managing. And it's crazy how that whole thing has developed. And I met Arm through Locked On. He hosts Locked On Marlins and uh, Locked On MLB Prospects. And, uh, you know, we met through this. And then obviously a friendship formed that he started just baseball. I ended up there. And here I am five years later from the beginning of this journey. And since then, I have met and I married my wife. And it's just crazy how much my life has changed and how much I went through in this five-year period. So um, to be here March 24, 2024, and to think about where I was March 24, 2019, it's an insane journey. And you couldn't have told me then all the things that would have happened and where I'd be. And to think of what this show has done in that time how much it's grown. I was looking at that number again, 1,344 podcasts. If there's any baseball podcast out there that has done more episodes than me, I would love to hear from you because I think that I have been maniacally committed to this as far as just always wanting to do shows because I love it. I absolutely love it. And if I had to go back to doing it for free, I would. Um, it's My day doesn't feel complete unless I hop on a mic and do a show. And I've taken my mic everywhere. You know, I, I visited my sister countless of times. She lives in Chicago and I've recorded, you know, shows in her garage and their car because there's kids upstairs, my nephews that could be crying or you don't want to wake them up. So I've been, I've been there doing shows. Uh, I went on you know, a, a trip where I, I went to Binghamton and Syracuse and you know, first in New York to see the Mets and to all the affiliates took my mic with me. It was just me in a rental car and just doing shows all the way across me and my dad going baseball road trips. Uh, one time my, my brother-in-law went with us. We went to 
Pittsburgh, Cincinnati. I was doing shows um, the whole time. I took my mic on my honeymoon and I didn't do a lot, but I did. I did a show at least. I think I might have done two in, in, in the parking lot of the hotel. So again, uh, it's just been a crazy ride. And I think also speaking of just crazy times doing a podcast, I, I will say that the kicker for me, the, 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 the most insane podcast I ever did was the Carlos Correa show. I don't know if any of you remember this one, but uh, you can watch the intro of that podcast on YouTube where I am in a Goodwill parking lot and it is five o'clock in the morning. And I was visiting uh, some family in Indiana. Like I said, my sister's in Illinois. So I, I drove down to visit some of my cousins out there and my grandma. And I was staying with one of my cousins. and He works construction. So he's up early. I wake up to go to the bathroom, middle of the night. I see the Correa stuff. And I'm freaking out. And I'm like feeling anxious that I can't record something. See my cousin going to work. I said, dude, I'm, I'm going out with you. So as he kind of turns the alarm off, gets out of the house, I go out with him all my stuff i'm from south florida it's snowing out there i don't know how to de-ice a car i'm like trying to de-ice my sister's car do whatever i can end up in the goodwill parking lot i record this show um and then i drive straight to illinois with on two hours of sleep and then i remember getting to uh you know their house my, my sister my brother-in-law's house and seeing that this podcast they did in the Google parking lot had like 10,000, 11,000 views on YouTube and was blowing up. And that was just the most insane, insane week, really, the whole saga. But I think back to all those different things over these five years, all the different stories I've covered. This team is just awesome. Um, even when they're not awesome, they're awesome to cover. There's always a story. And uh, I'm thrilled to do a show like this in five more years when I hit that 10-year anniversary to see where my life has grown then who knows where I'll be. I might be a dad for all I know. That'd be kind of nuts, uh, but yeah, man, uh, I just had to take an episode here uh, for all of you that have been part of this journey uh, to just recap five incredible life-changing years for me. So thank you all sincerely for tuning in and giving me th this ability to do this. Um, thank you to the Locked On Podcast Network for giving me the platform, David Locke, for giving me the show. Um, thank you to the different sites that I've written for during this time, Metsmerize at the beginning of the show. It was so amazing to work with them for years. Um, and, and then, of course, just based on where I'm at now, uh, I, just, I love I love my jobs. So uh, I'm, I'm really just so blessed. And, um, of course, always – the last thank you goes out to the number one listener, and that's always my dad, uh, for <laughs> talking me out of quitting this thing a couple times, um, for always believing in me, and uh, for always tuning in. So, uh, And shout out to my Uncle Joe as well for, for starting me off in this journey. Uh, anyway, that'll be all for uh, the 1,344th episode of Locked on Nets. And I'll be back tomorrow to do 1,345. As always, uh, you can follow wherever you get your podcast. Subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. Follow me on, on Twitter at Finkelstein Ryan. Follow the show at Locked on Mets. Um, thank you for tuning in.